Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Love Hour podcast. I'm your host, Ms. Kevin Stage, and I'm joined by my husband and co-host. The Kev on stage. No mic today. We are social distancing because we have some stuff going on in the house today. So I am here. He is there. But we're still going to bring you the love hour. We have no guests. I'm actually going to take a break on guests for a little while simply because child, I'd be wanting to take a break. So that's what we're going to do. It'll be just Kevin take and a I break. for a little break. while. Um, I, ha I have an idea of the series that I want to do when we come back, but I just don't know when it'll be that I actually come back. It'll be a light series because I feel like all the singles that listen to the love hour have wanted me to Let do a single series. Ready. And so that's what uh, I think uh, I want to do. I would appreciate that. A Fertility single series? Great. And, uh, I'm talking about the lightness. Oh, yeah. Fertility yeah, yeah. might have been the hardest series for, for me. I was like, whew, this is tough. It's, I know how important it is, and I know I get it, and I know why you did it, and I'm proud of you. I understand. But them days, I was like, this is the sad. Yeah, what's this funny, is the um, McIntyre, Shantaya and Michael McIntyre, we were supposed to talk about um, infertility with them because they, she actually had a second secondary infertility and she ended up adopting. And then we ended up just like laughing and joking and just like having a good time that I didn't want to like... I don't know, rule so the vibe of what was going on. And so we just want what, what was already established. I actually think it worked out really, really well. Um, oh, the single crew has a emoji. It looks like the loading thing. Maybe it's like for their boo is loading. Oh, I like it. I have- I was like, like are, are we buffering? But I think it might be uh, partner loading. Yeah, I'm, I'm that, that I love that track. actually. So I think that would be the series that I would do. I I follow some phenomenal like single um, speakers. I guess I don't exactly know what to call them, but um, or single influencers. I don't know what to call them. Anyways, I think they're phenomenal. I really think that they're quite good. So I've been following some of them for a while because this has been an idea that I've had. So I will once I you know take a break and kind of regroup. Um, I think that'll be something that we'll do in the future. But today, what we want to do is talk about building a brand, a legacy, an empire, and a family, which it may only be three when I do the title, because I feel like that's quite long. Mm. What do you Brand, think? legacy, empire, family? Yeah. Maybe just brand, legacy, empire. Who, we don't need the family. Hello? I think, <laughs> I think you do. I think that's part of the... I think it's but part you're of so the far in the screen. You got you're not filling the screen. My face is all big and closed. Well, how do I <laughs> do that? Yeah, that's better. That's better. I hate it looks we gotta be like like this. Yeah. You look like un bebe. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. I also have a big face, so I tend to fill the screen. I know. I'm like, I don't know. You want me to be like this? No, I don't. It's weird. <laughs> Um, okay, so the reason why I wanted to discuss this topic is because obviously, or not obviously, maybe you don't know, Kevin just started a podcast with Joey O, our youngest son. The first episode dropped and it was quite cute, actually. I thought it was really, really, really cute. But one of the things that Kevin was talking about is the idea that our kids are around a lot of entrepreneurs, like all of our friends are pretty much entrepreneurs. So it's all that they know. And so that's what they're naturally gravitating toward. And so I wanted to discuss what that, well, I guess starting off, what that means to build a brand and establishing this legacy that your kids are receiving as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what are your thoughts? What do you have to say first? Well, first, the fact that Joe asked me to do a podcast and I knew he was serious because he he asked me on multiple occasions. Yeah. And we were supposed to do it on Saturday. Then we had some stuff to do. We were supposed to do it on Sunday early. We had some stuff to do. Then we came back and took a nap. And he, when we woke, as soon as I woke up, he was like, so are we shooting? And I was like, okay, so he's serious. Yeah. Joe, don't be playing around when he wants to do something. I wonder where he gets that from. Mm -hmm. um, when he wants to do something, he don't be playing around. So we shot it. And I've watched it a million times mainly because I was so doggone impressed with <laughs> how good he was at being like, obviously I'm biased because I am his father and I brought him into this world. 
Um, First of all, you did not. I was waiting for here. you. The <laughs> only person that has the scar that will not remove from her body is me. But continue. I put the bu- I put the bun in the oven. You put it on bake. I'm no. Cool. I'm not going to go further with this analogy. So continue. <laughs> I put the. I put the um, but anyway, be that as it may, uh, I'm super biased. But I was watching and I was like, yo, this kid is really good the most impressive thing he did is i set a timer on my laptop because i i I did a fake ad for him so that he can get used to doing ads right so i bought an ad for the comedy show for him and i put my laptop behind the camera and i started a 10 minute timer because he said he's he wanted his podcast to be 20 25 minutes i said okay if you're doing ads it's going to come around the 10 minute mark Right. So I put 10 minutes in and I didn't say anything. I told him when the, when that gets to zero, you got to do an ad within one minute, you know. And I watched him and I was going to, you know, like nudge him or something like that. And he did his best version of transitioning yeah, into an ad right. smoothly. And I could have, I was so proud, Melissa. Yeah, I was like, ah. Oh. He, I was like, this boy really, see, you know, the crazy thing is I don't, it doesn't click how much they see us do this. Right. And it never seems like they're paying attention. They're always on their phone or playing with their switch, but he watches more than Isaiah does. Yeah. Now he'll well, come, I he think, comes to the office more. He hangs out more. Both, I think they're both watching. I think they're watching with a different eye. So even thinking back to, um, you know, I give the example of, you know, you and I both started watching YouTube, so to speak, at the same, at relatively at the same time when we were both at Bowling. You yeah. were watching it from uh, on stage or a creative perspective, creator perspective, when you were watching, mm-hmm. you know, Timothy Delegato back then, because he was a big YouTuber, all those type of people, you're thinking... Yeah. What am I learning from you so that I too can turn on the camera and do this? I was watching it, but I'm looking at it from a consumer's perspective. So even oftentimes when you're creating things, I'm often like, I feel like that's too long. It's never long enough for you because you're like, it's funny, keep it all there. As an audience, I'm like, I've kept out of this, cut that. And I think that's the difference in the perspectives that even with them, Joey is, he watches YouTube all day long. Who knew that maybe he wants to be like a YouTuber, so to speak, or a front cameraman. Isaiah is looking at things like that CGI was off. Did you see this? What about this? Let me learn about the actors. Let me learn. He's looking at it. They're watching, but they're watching from a different perspective. So they're get, gleaning different information. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And that's actually really good insight from our kids. I didn't even think about that. Isaiah watches movie reviews of movies he hasn't seen and sees like, and he'll watch like a video of like how to develop great characters or right. whatever, stuff like that. And Joe watches creators and he he watches like the people who do, who do Let's Plays and who he likes, right? That's why he can joke around about doing smash that like button. Like the fact right. that he knows that that's a tactic. It's the joke, right. It, it's the joke. So. When, it, when I'm watching him, I'm like, he's captivating. Mm-hmm. He, he held the conversation. He's, I actually saw him do jokes the way I do jokes. Absolutely. Even when if he was like, talking about his mannerisms yeah. and it's funny to watch him and also see yourself. So something yes. that I- it's that, somebody had a funny comment about that. They said, it's like, he's like part Melissa, part Kev, kind of like they had it, like if they had a kid or something. Yeah. Well, and I think <laughs> it's funny because even in Washington, and I, I think we'll we'll move off Joe and kind of go back to the bigger conversation. Oh, stay on him. Yeah, he's stay on baby. topic. That's no Joe is me in that regard. But- He was uh, not going for it. No, and I'm the same way. Like uh, we're yes. over here. I wanted us to be here. Let's pull it back in. Okay. I have an agenda. Let's Let's get through it. He was um, like, all right, you're going off. Yeah. Puffy, puffy. Back yeah. on topic. The topic is women's that. shoes. That's what we're talking about. Right. But the, one of the things that I noticed he kept doing, and I was like, okay, so that's absolutely something that I do, is he says ain't. But in normal conversation, I don't really say ain't. But when I'm trying to be animated or funny or prove a point, so he kept saying, like, I ain't going outside. Yeah. That, that's my inflection. That's my tone. That's oh, my yeah. Voice. Was, this triangle is your face. I actually never, thank you, Jesse. God bless you. 
I actually. <laughs> no, they didn't have creamer. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> he, I never saw him look so much like you than on that episode, especially when he was mocking you. Oh yeah. I was like, oh my god, you are your you are your mother's child. And the last thing I want to say. When he did the pants thing, you ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Where you finna go? Nowhere. I don't have no pants on. If I didn't show you this, I was like, oh my gosh, that is my whole comedic Absolutely. ability. That is my Absolutely. whole comedic style. That whole. Th but then he'll be very subdued and be like you. So he's like a a dry version of me that can do what I do, but is not like me all the time. Right. And I think that, um, again, goes back to this idea of like the legacy that you're leaving your children. I, you know, I think, oh, I looked this up. Hold on. Let me find my definition. I found an actual definition for legacy. And it is a gift of property, especially personal property, as money by will or bequest. But one of the things I, you know, who am I? Who are me? However, I'm about to say what I'm about to say. Uh, to add to that, I think sometimes legacy is also those characteristics and traits and personality things that you pass down to the, your kids that they recognize yep. as a skill. So mm -hmm. it's one thing to just come from a funny family. It's another yep. thing to learn how to monetize that funny. I feel like that yep. too is legacy. I, I, 100%. Even Joe's idea, we went to the dentist yesterday and as we're walking out of the car, he says to me, uh, keep that in the house. What, what did he say? Everything is house. Everything is house. That's what he said. Everything is house. And I was like, what are you, I don't know what you're saying. He's like, mommy, we can do a shirt. We need things that say, or mother, we need things that say everything is house. And I was like, Joe, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying to me. Like, I don't get it. He's like, mom, in the podcast, we were talking about like house shoes and this and that and that third. And I was like, okay. He was like, we should put that on a shirt. I said, well, you should text daddy. Even his mind thinking about, okay, I have this podcast and, you know, now I need to figure out how to, you know, have merch and I need to. Yeah. Hold, hold. So um, I, I even think that that is, you know, part of entrepreneurship. And then again, just to kind of transfer it over to like the brand perspective is that we don't know what we're doing. Our parents weren't entrepreneurs. I mean, I guess your mom dabbled in entrepreneurship, but no, she did it. Like she didn't. Oh, you mean like full time? Right, 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 right. And yeah, yeah. I mean, she like, always had a hustle point. Right. And she always, I mean, your husband, I mean, your husband, your dad always worked. So it was kind of like, you know, and she managed to like, she worked at the church and she, so she had, and it, she dabbled in it. You know what I mean? But I think yeah. to really kind of create a business, an empire, which is another one of the words I wanted to use for the title of this is that we're building an empire. And part of that is, is establishing the legacy that you leave for your children. So how do you go ahead? No, no, I was just, go, you, you were going to ask a question. I'm just so excited. Go, no, go ahead. I just wanted to say that Joe is pretty adamantly said he doesn't want to go to college, oh, right? Yeah. And we have been like, you know, college is just the next thing. Isaiah is like, I want to go not only to college, I want to go to film school. Right. <laughs> that is what I want to do. I want to go to film school because I want to direct movies. Joe is like, I don't want to go to one more second of school than I absolutely have to. And he said he wanted to be a stand-up comedian. He wanted to be a podcaster. So for me, it was like, I feel mo the most proud because what, what we can offer our kids is something our parents can offer. And this is not to shade them. Like they, they took us out of what our situation would have been and allowed us to be this. Like they did their part and we're doing our part. Um, but we, give, we can give our children the resources to pursue their dreams, right? They can say, I, Joe can say, I want to do a podcast and we can shoot it. Like in th this room right here, we can build that into a studio. We can like shoot for real. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, and then we can monetize it. Like, I don't want to monetize it right now because I want him to like do it without any pressure and I'll be the one to buy his first ads. But it's like, by the time this kid graduates high school, he can be a pro, like the same way we talked about this before. Joe's really good at soccer, but I used to want him to go to the Premier League. Yeah. And then I realized like those kids have been pros 
since they're like eight, nine, 10, right, 11, right. like in an academy and stuff. Uh, a tennis pro can go pro at like 11, 12, boxers at like 15, 16. If he's getting paid for even the dynamic ads, if Audio Boom just puts dynamic ads on the podcast, no red ads, he's technically a professional sure. or he's getting paid, right? Right, right, right. Um, and his 10,000 hours is going to come so much earlier. We're not even counting the years of Awesomeness TV. Mm -hmm. That's just, and the other thing I'm glad is I did not push him to do this. He came back and was like, this is what I want to do. I want to be like you. And he always paid a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit more attention, like you said, to the performance aspect of stuff. And Isaiah always paid more attention. Now that I'm thinking about on set, Isaiah watched the director right. when, when we were on the uh, major deal set. Josiah watched the actors. Right. Isaiah wants to stand behind the camera. He's like, why did you shoot that? What's the lens? Right. And Joe's like, why did you, why are you doing this again if they right. did it? You know what I'm saying? Right. So right. my goal is one day for Isaiah to direct the movie that Joe stars in. That would be like, I, I would, I would, I would just, I, I would, I, and also it's my last thing I want to say, and I want to continue to let you do your thing. It is so rewarding for your kids to be interested in what you do on right. their own accord. Like if, if they wanted to be a mathematician or mechanic, I, it wouldn't really matter to me. Once they both didn't want to play basketball, I was like, okay, so parenthood isn't about forcing them to do what you like. It's about letting them find their own thing. So I didn't really care if they wanted to do what I did, but I ain't gonna lie and say, I'm not super ecstatic that he asked me to do a podcast and was like, okay, now my next topic, I want to talk about why are there so many colors? <laughs> I just thought it was such a, like, <laughs> such a funny thing to talk about. You know, like, why are there so many covers? Let's talk about color. So anyway, um, I love it so much. I'm, I'm, it is my most, I'm sorry, Liz, and I'm sorry, Angel, okay. and I'm sorry, dear Kev. It is my favorite podcast, and we've only done one episode. I, I think that's okay. You're, you're obviously a part of it, but I think, you know, to be super proud of what your son is doing, I think that's okay. The other thing I was going to say is that one of the questions that I absolutely, I realize now and as, as an adult that I hate, and I've started to rephrase the way that I even ask the boys is, what do you want to be when you grow up? The, mm -hmm. What I realize is that part of knowing what you want to do is being exposed to many of things, what you might yeah. want to do, what you don't, what you know you don't want to do, like be that exposure to the, everything it, what, is what kind of narrows in what you're actually interested in. And when you're five, six, yeah. seven years old, you simply don't have that exposure. So even a yeah. kid saying, I want to be a doctor they don't even know enough to decide that's what they want to do. So part of, yeah. I feel like our job as parents is actually not pigeonholing them into one specific thing, but allowing them the opportunity to be exposed to many things. So try yeah, doing like, podcasts, yeah. try doing acting, mm -hmm. also try soccer, also try math, also try science, try engineering, try architecture, like try all of these things. And you can find out, I absolutely hate this. And beyond that, this specifically is what I don't like. So then yeah, when yeah. another job comes up, you know, it's not just, I don't like, you know, the medical field. I specifically don't like this aspect of it. So any right. job that is centered around this specific aspect, I know right away that's not a match for me. And what we don't often do is have that exposure. Even as adults, I feel like as adults, it's oftentimes where we're like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I like. And it's because we're afraid to try new things. But part of recognizing what you want to do is the, the freedom to be exposed to many different things, trying a gazillion different things and being comfortable saying that ain't it and not being looked at as a failure. So good. Everything you said is so good. Two things I want to say on that. Remember when Joe, like we would travel a lot trying to expose them, like you're talking about, just to the world in general, just so they see that the world is big. Right. And also made me really happy when Joe said Japan is one of the best moments of my life and then realized that flying first class is like, I don't even should complain. I right. just, I know. But remember when he was like, we noticed he's kind of really good at taking pictures. Like, yeah. man, you actually like have a good eye. We have Josh who can be like, this is what I do. Here's what right. I use. You know what I mean? If he wants to go down that path. But right now he's just like, and I notice he only likes taking pictures when he sees beautiful scenery. Right. It's not people. 
he's like, oh, this looks cool. Like that uh, sushi restaurant we went to. And when right. we travel the world, he's like, oh, man. And he has all the pictures from everywhere we went saved in his phone. And then I think about Mel, how Mel knew at like, when I met Mel, she was 12 years old. She was in the AV club and she was like, I want to be like Oprah. I want to work in TV and film when I grow up. Right. She's 12. That girl is a, a full Netflix executive. She so she knew what she wanted to do, but it took having access to that at school, having parents who could pay for her to go to college and, get, and then even the money for internships at um, the radio station, I can't remember the name of it, uh, and the TV stuff that she did, and then eventually getting into Cartoon Network and then knowing like she's amazing because she basically know what she wanted to do for a long time and then like went down that path right. for it. And I think just like having kids that can do that. And even it even spreads out to all of our, like our nieces and nephews. Julian is like, he sells resale shoes. And I bought some uh, shoes from him. Like mm -hmm. if you are a business runner as a hustler, as a kid, I'm all in. Uh, um, I remember when I, I've talked about this before. Um, I had that candy shop at kids right. when I was a kid and I had the lawn mowing thing and I, 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 I marketed my own um, um, lawn care company. And um, I see that in my kids that I got um, from my mom. And I see that in my kids and I see it in my nieces and nephews and Jake kids are like, I want to do what Uncle Kevin does. He do whatever he want to do. He runs his own businesses and stuff. And I'm just glad that they can be exposed to that. Cause you were talking about doctor and lawyer. You know why that, I think that comes from like, when you're a kid and you watch those shows, it's like, what do you want to be? This is a doctor, this is a lawyer. You know what I mean? Like this is an engineer, Bob the Builder works construction. That's all you kind of hear about when you're watching stuff like that. You don't hear like, I want to own a podcast. I want to be a podcaster. Right. That's not even a thing that's available to you. Right. And I think part of it is because as adults, we're not exposed to that. The only thing I knew right. was teacher, lawyer, doctor. You don't, you don't even recognize that there's so many, even as an example, and this is not just to focus on like the entrepreneurial aspect, but I worked in the aerospace industry and I was a procurement agent. I didn't even know that was a job. I didn't know that that was a thing. I did not know that that was even a possibility. And so part of it is that our minds haven't been exposed to right. all of the different opportunities and jobs that there are available for us. I worked in contracts and in procurement, but either way, contracts, I didn't even know that was a, you know what I mean? A job that we could do. And so I think that um, our job in creating, again, the idea of this legacy for our children, whether you're an entrepreneur or not is figuring out helping your kids figure out figure out what they are actually good at and and being able to capitalize on that in more ways than just doctor lawyer teacher like there are so many other job opportunities out there that we just don't that we just don't know about yeah absolutely um the other thing i was gonna say is one thing that is you know kind of um, difficult, I would say, in trying to do all of these things. I mean, we very heavily just talked about being the parent aspect of building, you know what I mean? Building this legacy in regards to what it means to be a parent. And one of the best ways that you can build your legacy is by popping a blue chew. I mean, what better way than to establish uh, your legacy and your, what is it called when you're talking about your, your child? Your what? Your seed? Your, yeah, maybe your seed. I kept thinking of next of kin, but maybe your seed is get a start on all of it and pop a blue chew. You guys know Create that. Your legacy starts with a hard penis. Yes, it does. And so we want to tell you about Blue Chew. You guys already know about Blue Chew. They are friends of the podcast and there is no better time than quarantine than uh, popping a Blue Chew and getting it on and popping and establishing your legacy. Are you done? Yes. If you're, this is your first time hearing about Blue Chew, listen, they are the first chewable tablet. They have an FDA approved in active ingredients as Viagra. Lineage. 
and C. Alice. They will help you establish your legacy. I'm being funny, but um, they're made in the USA, which is a really big deal right now. I feel like a lot of people are, are concerned about where things are made. So this is made in the USA. And best of all, you do not have to leave your house because we're concerned about going out with our mask and picking up things. They will deliver things straight to your door in discreet packaging so you don't have to worry about your neighbors or your uh, existing legacies being all up in your business because they will deliver it to your house in discreet packaging. All you're gonna do is go to bluechew.com to get your first shipment for free. Use promo code love. All you're gonna do is pay $5 for shipping. That's blue like the color, B-L-U-E, chew.com, promo code love. Try it for love. free. And as always, Blue Chew, thank you for always being a, you know, a down and dirty uh, podcast supporter. Sponsor the podcast and sponsor my penis. And sponsoring the legacies of 2020. I also want to tell you about Better Help. I have been on Better Help. I actually just went back on their app this weekend and um, am still looking for a therapist. But I'm going to tell you one of the best things about this is that you can take your time finding your perfect match. I don't know if this is what you're supposed to do, but this is what I always do. I go in there, I, you know, you fill out, these are the criteria that I want. They give you a host of uh, potential therapists. You can sign up for one uh, session. You see if you're vibing or not, and then you have, um, and then you decide if you want to continue to see them or not. Uh, it's been going really, really well for me. I think during this time, we're all at a point where we need someone to talk to, or we're mm -hmm. probably experiencing some sort of, um, trauma right now with the way 2020 is working. I think we're all just easily, uh, huh? I said easily. It's some, it's some mental trauma. Yeah. I think we're all just really stressed and just have a lot. I know I personally have a lot going on, which is why I'm like, I need to find this perfect match. You can start communicating within 48 hours. You literally can decide if you want a male or a female, if you want them to be Christian or not, if you want them to be a person of color or not. Like, these are all the things that matter. You want someone that looks like you, maybe understands your culture, and you can absolutely kind of detail these things through the BetterHelp app. Listen, therapy has been the single best thing to come out of quarantine for me. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I have my weekly scheduled therapist, but what better help offers me is a little bit more time to have somebody when I need them. Um, my wife is the reason that I started therapy and she actually probably is the most, uh, the, the main beneficiary of it. And I want you to have that, whether you're single, married, whatever, uh, targeting your issues and, helping to point out your problematic areas is super important. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. This service is available for clients worldwide. You don't have to be subject to just the people around you. You might live in Macomb, Mississippi, and they might not have the best therapist in Macomb. No disrespect to Macomb. It's just a small town. Uh, your therapist might live in Kansas City or New York or Waco, Texas. And with better help, you can get them right in your face. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. I also like this. I'd be doing therapy in my car, in my garage, in my Maserati that I have to turn in on Friday. Better help is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they can make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Visit betterhelp.com slash love hour. That's better help. That's H E L P and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using better help that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. That's because we need help. Special offer for love hour listeners get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash love hour. Highly love hour and that you guys do this. Highly recommend that you guys do this. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about as well in this building an empire, legacy, a family, a brand is the balancing act of it all. So one of the things that I, you and I were just having this conversation that I struggle with quite a bit 
is that when I have to choose between brand building, business, or being a mom or a wife, I always choose mom or wife. So I'll get up and make breakfast. I'll go to the grocery store and cook dinner. I'll clean up. I'll throw a load of clothes in the laundry. Like I will do those tasks, so to speak, instead of building the Miss Kev on stage brand. Recently, I've started to take that a little bit more seriously, but we need the Miss Kev on stage brand. But even still, I struggle with that. So how do you find, do you feel like you're, you know, balance in, in quotations, because we understand that balance isn't a thing, but do you find yourself in a struggle with that? I, it's my struggle like is on stage it. interview, isn't it? No, no, it feels oh. like a conversation. Okay. Uh, one, oh no, don't what? No, don't restart my computer. I've been I've been pushing this restart for so long. I just got a notification that said we're turning your computer off in fifty eight seconds. Like, don't do that. <laughs> I'm gonna keep on pushing this thing. This is probably like the second year I've been doing this. But anyway, um, my thing is the other way around. Okay. My okay. natural inclination is to do the work stuff, and it always comes first. There's a part of the big leap, and I see some people saying it's a hard audio listen, so read the book. I, I always read books, not because of audio book. I just, if I don't read a book, my mind just wanders. If I'm not, if I, when I listen, I can't focus. So I- Are you talking about the big leap? I missed if you actually said that. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about the big leap. Yeah, that's but actually gonna be my book for, for um, next month in the book club. Okay, there's a specific part of the book where the author talks about what you just said, and he said a lot of women feel that I am not doing my womanly, wifely, motherly duties um, because of this creative passion. And sometimes that's the way we raise, sometimes that's society. And sometimes it's a coping mechanism to like say, hey, it's okay that I don't do this because I've got to take care of this, this, that, and that, right? Um, I, it's a fair thing because you want to be a good mom. And also like your mom, and I can attest to this, because I used to go to your house for this reason, your mom cooked hot breakfast every day. She did. Every single, every day. And she worked. So like she wasn't staying at home. Like every day I went to, I remember I, I told this story before, but I don't care. It's funny every time. I had went to your house for like two weeks and I just started going over there to eat breakfast because I was like, bro, she be making French toast sticks, like grits, like always something. It wasn't always like she's slaving, but she would have Costco, but it was always hot and ready. Yeah. And I told my mom, hey, you know, Melissa mom cooks hot breakfast every day. Do you think you could do that? My mom was like, sure, yes. You know what? I'm glad you asked. And the next morning, she had a bowl of Fruit Loops on the table. No spoon, no milk, just one bowl of Fruit Loops. And I was like, you could have just said no. If you didn't really <laughs> want to do it, like, you if tried. your heart wasn't, just say no. Like, everybody's not like that. So I think that's something that was modeled for you. And yeah. maybe you associate being a good mother with cooking and cleaning and doing motherly things. That wasn't model for me. My mom didn't care. She didn't cook. She made sure food was available. And I always saw, actually, this is actually becoming clear to me now. Uh -huh. I always saw her working on her business. Mm. When I would come in from playing, she'd be at the laptop or the, the you know, we had no laptop. She'd be at the desktop designing flyers, printing out flyers, asking what I thought. Kev, do you think a travel business will work? You want to tell you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I always saw her doing that. So what was modeled for me is if you're hungry, go eat. I got to do this. I got to have a meeting. I got to set something up. So to me, a mother was a hustler. So I'm like, I'm being like, and I saw her writing books and doing poetry and teaching, you know what I'm saying? Like teaching classes in church. So I kind of gravitated towards that. So I think that you almost for you, it'd be like a rewiring of what a good mom is. Right. Because you always feel a way about Postmates and like eating out too much. And I, I, I think that is a fair part of that. Like, I don't discount that because I know your heart is, you want your kids to have healthy food and Postmates and all that type of stuff. I'm more like, all right, in order for us to do this business, maybe we need to get a chef. Not because we're rich, but because in order to do what we need to do I, and, and also have healthy food, I'd rather hire a chef or do meal prep or do whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like a housekeeper. It's not because I want to flex. It's because cleaning the house takes three hours on Saturday. If I shoot a brand deal video, I can make 15 times that amount 
in the same amount of time. So if it's $100 for someone else to clean the house and I can make potentially $15,000 in that same amount of time, I'll give you a hundred so that I can make 15,000. Right. And I don't feel no way about that, but you might feel a way, but also my house when I grew up was kind of, kind of messy. Not well, your house was pristine. My, my house was my like, mo my mom used to literally bleach the, um, the trash can on the outside of the house. Like I yeah. love have thought about doing this. The dumpster that's on the outside of the house, I'm like, oh, it stinks. It smells like trash. It's a dumpster. It should smell like trash. But there's a difference between like, oh, it's a dumpster trash and like, oh, this smells like trash. And so I feel like I should like go out there and like bleach it and pine saw it and like clean it out because those are the things my mom would do. But you bring up a really interesting point that uh, we kind of, and one of the points that I wanted to talk about is one of the things I said recently is um, broke is around the corner. Yes. So part of the reason that I have such a hard time or outsourcing or hiring help is because I always feel like broke is around the corner and you can't build a brand. You can't build an empire. You can't build a business trying to do everything yourself. And our, our build every, do everything ourselves is different. Yours is very much your control freak and that's what you want to do. Mine is, but if I outsource it, I have to pay you. <laughs> What if tomorrow I don't have the money and I gave it to you today, then I'm stuck tomorrow. So let me hold on to everything because I don't know what the future holds. And you can't eat I'm neither one of these is sustainable. Neither one of our models is sustainable. No, it's the kite and the string now need to work together. It's the to, kite and the string that now I got it. Say yeah, it. I need to work together. Huh? Keep going. I like it. So we were shooting this weekend and I was driving the Maserati and we pulled up to a shoot with a friend of ours and her, her manager, I pulled up with the Maserati. He got the Rolls Royce Bentley coupe, okay? Pitch black windows and he's not renting it. He has it for real. Right. I felt a way, I almost backed out the Maserati and parked it down the block. Not because it wasn't a pristine car, it was, it ain't no Rolls, right. but also, he had he had the roles for real. Right, 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 one right. Said, one thing he said Saturday that I never thought about. He said nobody becomes a millionaire by saving. They nobody become a millionaire a by, by investing. Okay. There's some things that we're working on that we are, you know, we've been talking about in you know, blah, blah, that require a super investment, right? Okay. And even I'm like, whoo. And because they wanted their money up front. And I'm like, what if it doesn't have to work? And the money is gone now. I cannot return it up to me, boy. And I think about the Bible, like when they got, that person got the talents, you can't bury them. And in order to make a million, you might have to lose 10,000, right? right? Whatever, like there's some risk associated with that. And for me, I always think about me lying on my deathbed. It's not as morbid as this, but this is what I think about. I want to lie on my deathbed and, and go peacefully knowing, boy, I gave it everything. I right. mean, I, I royally missed sometimes. We remember that thing we did? That sucked, actually. Remember that house we got to live in for a while? It was dope. We only got to live there for a minute, but boy, remember when we was on the golf course? Like, remember when we came to get this house, you were like, Kev, I don't know. I was like, listen, whether we stay here for a month or a year, we will be able to say, we used to live on the golf course, boy. Now we're in this cardboard box. <laughs> but once upon a time, you know, we lived in so, and with my family, and that's why I'm always like, let's travel. Let's go to Amsterdam. Let's go to Japan. Like, let's do all the things because didn't think about quarantine. We for sure can't do that stuff now. Right. But it's so that when I die, I can die knowing I freaking gave it everything. And I didn't. I, I will mentally deteriorate if on my deathbed, I'm like, what if I just would have just gave it everything? What would have happened? And that's kind of what I want my kids to see, like, bro, go for it. You, you might fail. That is a real possibility. It I, is a real thing. No, and I But think you might not fail. Right. And I think what's so funny is I feel like I have the fear on both ends so sometimes i have to psych myself up to just be like okay do it right now if you don't do it right now you're gonna change your mind tomorrow so do it right now because 
if I literally <laughs> don't do it in the moment that I'm feeling the conviction and the passion, once it passes, there's no guarantee it'll ever come back because I have yeah. the fear in, and it exists on both ends. So while your fear may be, you know, I did it all, win or lose, I know that I have exhausted all possibilities in this lifetime. Yeah. I have this really weird, God, I don't want to not do everything you have for me to do. And dang, I also freaks me out to be what I absolutely could be because I feel like there's so much exposure and vulnerability and you become like this target for people to like throw darts at you and it freaks me out. And so you know, balancing fair, though, those two things, huh? I said, that's fair. Like you're not, your fears aren't boogeyman in the closet. Your fears are things that have legit happened. Like when you get big, you do become a target. That's yeah. not an irrational fear. Right. We've seen that happen. We've seen people be like, this is not what I want. This is not what I like. Like, you know, that's not an irrational fear. I just want to say that, like, you're not tripping. You, right. Those are legit fears for a reason. However, I don't think you should be crippled by those fears. Right. And that's the, I feel like the, um, sorry, I looked at the lights and now I'm like seeing stars. Um I feel like the, you know, the phase of life and part of the reason, even when I'm thinking about the book club and we're doing the big leap, literally next month, I feel like the whole theme is going to be the big leap because I feel like I finally got to a point of frustration with myself of wanting and wishing, but never actually doing uh, of hoping and visualizing, but never actually doing. So I feel like, okay, Melissa, you can hope, wish, want, you could see, visualize, daydream, do all of these things. But until you actually do, it's just a dream. It's just midnight prayers. It's really nothing else. And so, but I had to get over, again, going back to that original thought is I had to get over um, broke is around the corner because there are yeah. things and, and there's, a, there's a level of, excellence I'll use that I want to put out and that's not something I can do on my own one of the things I had to realize is that if you're if if this is what you want and you recognize it's something you can't produce on your own that means you have to hire help if you have to hire help that means it's going to cost you some dollars you either have to be okay with receiving an invoice and hitting pay or <laughs> shut up about it and so I had to like have yeah. that really Did that happen in your mind? Were you yes, telling yourself? I, yes. I have to have these conversations with myself like this in order for, in order for me to move, in order for yeah. me to do. And so, you know, again, this is kind of a lot when it comes to building the brand and the legacy, but you know, I, I you know, hired these photographers, whatever. And it was so easy. This is how it works when you're like scared and you really don't want to do it. So I was like, I want to hire black women. Like that's the thing. Black women don't support black women. Then who's going to support us? You need to hire black women. So I'm searching high and low, looking for a black photographer, black women photographers. It took me a good day and a half to find some. And in the very beginning, it's very easy to just be like, well, I mean, I guess this is a sign. <laughs> I oh yeah, you don't need to sign when you don't want to do it. Listen, let me just give up. And I still have to like talk myself over that hump in order to continue to do. Otherwise, it would be three weeks later where I am today still talking about what I want to do is, and that's it. That's as far as the conversation goes. Mm -hmm. I, I Listen, it's so funny because I see it in you. But it is so, me and your sister, Mel, are more alike, and you and Greg are more alike in this way. Oh. Um, you know, Mel is like, let's go. Let's go travel. Let's spend this money. I don't want to live here. And I'm like, let's, you know, let's do it. Uh, but it's also how you're wired and how, how, how I'm wired and why we got to, you know, why we work better together because I can see, like, you know, especially in this season of our life, you being who you are has saved us a lot of times. Yeah. And maybe me being who I am has inspired you sometimes. No, absolutely. Even when you think about the kite and the string, that analogy that I really love, thank you 
Reggie Lee for giving that to us. But um, one of the things that Shantaya said is that I would be a kite and drift away. And one of the things I think is really an analogy that I see or visual, I think is a better word that I see, is the kite without the string, Not you go high, but you also can fly too close to the sun. And that's dangerous. The yeah. opposite, though, is true to the, with the string. The string needs the kite to be lifted up. Without yeah. it, you fall to the ground and you go nowhere. Yeah. And I feel like that's exactly the risk of a kite without a string and a string without the kite. It's twofold. You both have value and serve a purpose in this relationship. And you have to be careful not to despise the kite for taking you out of your comfort zone to the point where maybe you feel like it's all a failure and not despise the string where you feel like we're not going fast enough, we're not doing everything that I want to see because they're also keeping you from flying too close to the sun and crashing and burning basically. 100%. Okay, I think that those are really valuable lessons for, you know, anybody that's in this kind of kite and string dynamic. And I think it's something that over time you learn to appreciate. I think otherwise yeah. you become, you can become resentful of your kite or come become resentful right. of your string because you don't understand the value that they add. And these are things, like I said, that you learn over time. One thing that you don't have to um, press pause on and wait to learn is going on Skillshare, picking any number of things that they have available for you to learn. They have inspiring classes for creative and curious people and not just creative and curious people. They also have what I have coined um, the learned creative or the person that the is learned creative the learned creative or the person that is very much like me where you feel like you need to ground your creativity in something like nine to five ish so to speak so i'm like right. a spreadsheet person or whatever this uh the classes that they offer you will inspire you but also they help you again just kind of give you practical steps to ground that creativity in something that's actionable so i've taken tons of their classes i've taken a graphic design class we've taken photography classes i've taken branding classes i've taken time management classes like literally there's some of everything for everyone on this platform skillshare offers member membership with meaning with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creative, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. Skillshare has classes to fit your schedule and skill level. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshop, um, workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month, which is phenomenal. Ah because it's basically a bunch of master classes all in one place. And that's, you know, yes. that's what you need. Explore your creativity and get two month, two free months of premium membership. Two free months, two, Lisa? Two free months. Skillshare.com slash love hour. You're gonna get love two hour. whole months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Get started today. Head over to Skillshare.com slash love hour and when you love sign up, hour. make sure to tag us in the class that you're taking and tell us what you're learning uh again skillshare.com slash love hour love okay first of all i was totally like black girl magic and you were in church so our vibes did not match that's because i'm saved all the time hello judgment also i'm glad we talked about this today because i was like man i'm gonna i need to talk about jojo and I was gonna have to do it on Here's the Thing, because I, I, I was like, I gotta get this out. I'm so doggone proud of this boy. And I'm just so happy. So I'm glad we actually talked about it on this. Oh, good. Uh, the last, I guess, little bit we can talk about that I have in my notes is the idea. Did we cover all of that? Did you feel like we put a button on that topic? Oh. What? Yes. I just got a notification from the auto body thing that my vehicle's on track to be finished on Friday. and I'm. I keep it. Just keep it for a little while. Maserati Kev is not a real thing. It is. <laughs> I was hoping they were like, oh, the parts weren't in. We it's we need another month. Need the moment that it was. No. You know what though? I ain't gonna hold you. I'm getting the AC fixed before I turn that car back in. Oh, that's fine. I think you should get the AC fixed. Because I yeah, I th and that's not me just trying to extend it, but it is me just trying to extend it. I, I know. But it has been unnaturally hot here the last like month or so. 
it's been like over a hundred and you know, hundred degrees and that AC on that Toyota be like, I am for like 70 degrees. Well, and that car is old, Kev. That car, that car is old. I'm gonna tell you right now, Melissa Fredericks. But well, let me be right clear, now. I'm not saying by- No, 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 let me be clear. My money story is telling me that the answer is no. My God said yes. <laughs> when Jesus says yes, your no, listener wait, can wait, say, say no. no. I said Melissa can't say no. <laughs> that would have fit too. I uh, actually should have said that. Um, I hope that Toyota is like, ah, oh, it's going to be $8,000 to fix this. And I'd be like, what? This total. <laughs> when I got the estimate from the body shop, I was like, they told me, I was like, because that buffer was falling off. They were like $800. I was like, mm, that's a regular price. I, I need something to make me feel like this is not worth it. <laughs> and I want them to be like, Kevin, it ain't worth it. When I turn that Maserati on, that thing go wrong. Oh, I know, and it's fast, and it's a lot. Well, I am going to cry, to... Melissa, when wait, I have to give that car back. I'm wait, not wait, wait. Let's actually, it. like, kind of sit, settle on this here moment, for real. One of the things that I find to be actually really super inspiring from you, and I think maybe it's something that um, people that are listening in, in this, like, building empire brand legacy type of mindset, is that you are very easily inspired by things to drive you to do more. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So, so even with this um, Maserati situation, it it's more than just like, you know, you're kind of playing, but also in the back of your mind, you're like, no, 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 but this is gonna be my reality soon enough. How do you, it's like when, if you, or what we watch, but if the listeners watch, um, what was the Michael Jordan doc? The last dance. The last dance. And he would literally make up these stories about his opponents, uh, talking about, talking bad about him, you know, talking crap about his family, whatever. He would make up these scenarios to get himself to a point where he could meet and perform at an excellent level. I feel like you don't do that, but I definitely feel like you're very easily inspired by these situations. Like, I am so that? inspired. How do you, how do you stay motivated to do that and not feel like it's a far-fetched dream that's silly? I think that's a great question. Thank you. Part of, it, part of it is my competitive nature. Okay. Part of it is this doggone book because as much as I'm confident and ridiculous. I'm going to have you come on the big leap and like do a thing for the girls, for the booze. Me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I would, I was about to say we should get that guy. I might get him, Gay Hendricks. Um, I, I can go from zero to 60 in no time flat, just like the Maserati. I, it's the same reason I'm a, I'm a advertiser's wet dream. You right, can sell right. me on a story quickly and I can buy into it. Like, although I was playing with that Maserati message I had when I got it, I also was like, low key, this also could be God being like, bro, you can get this. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So the big leap was talking about like, not being afraid to live in your life. Like getting the, yeah, like I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly how they phrased it, but like maybe you can afford the car and you really can. And your reasoning for like, like the Toyotas, like I don't want, you know, like to be honest, my thing is like, if I had bought that Maserati for real, I probably would have never made that video because I don't want to ever come across as braggy. I would have just been driving it. But I'm like, let me just, like I have my parts of you too, where I'm like, the Corolla is safer, it's paid off, blah, blah, blah. In case, you know, whatever goes wrong, I always got a paid off car. But then I can also say Isaiah is 14, he'll be 16 soon. I can start teaching, well, you can start teaching him how to drive in that car and I can give it to him and I can get a mouse ride. I'm gonna tell you right now though, without a shadow of a doubt, there's no way I'm turning, when your lease is up for that Honda, there's no way I'm getting a Honda or anything like that. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna give you some time now to prepare your mind that's the last time I get a car like that. So just know, Maserati Kev yeah, might be right a year right or two. I, I By the time that lease is over, I, we might have dueling Maseratis. You might have the coupe, I might have the truck. I'm not living my life in fear no more. I'm not hiding my shine. I'm not gonna be humble because you're insecure. If my bank account says I can have a Maserati and everything else be good, 
then I'm going to drive it. And I'm not gonna brag, and I'm not gonna do anything like that, but I'm also not gonna be like, I'm not gonna have this because what will people think? People are gonna think something about me no matter what, so at least you're gonna have to think about me and watch the Maserati, cause that thing got some jump in it. You feel me? And also I got a Maserati message that the Lord gave to me today uh, for the comedy show tomorrow. Uh, so tune in there, God already gave it to me. Okay. But yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm not gonna brag anymore. I'm not gonna brag, but I'm also not gonna dim. Because I really, like I could be talking about what, yeah, because really it's what God has given me. So who am I to say, let me not talk about what God has done for me because of what me, people might say. Like y'all gonna have, say what y'all want, but that Maserati gonna be in the garage. You feel me? What is so interesting is the, the finding the balance and the difference between purposely and intentionally not dimming your shine, your light, and mm. feeling braggadocious. Like trying to find that balance. I, if we're being completely honest, I very much struggle with this, even to the point where, I don't know if Chloe is in the chat, but um, she was sent me um, a gift. Actually, it's a, a jewelry um, container because I showed the Blue Hive where I keep my jewelry in that plastic bag. So she was nice enough to send it to me. So when she was asking me for my address, she was like, um, I think I had misspelled the city. And I went immediately into like, no, 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 it's not that, it's this, that, and that. And she was like, first of all, girl, I wouldn't even ask you all that. Like, I was literally just asking because it came up this way. You gave it to me this way. I just needed you to confirm. And I was telling her that I immediately feel the need to downplay. And, and that's not, listen, let me all be clear. Like, that's not to say we out here living, you know, large, large. That's not at all. What but I'm also, but also. But I just feel like, you know, I think finding that balance I'm just saying is difficult. And even I remember, okay, we're going to get off this because this can go really kind of first world problems ish. And that's not what I want the conversation to be. But um, the point is, I think that you can become really inspired. And I think that's the mark, that type of like motivation and inspiration from other people that's not looked at as jealousy and it's not a, a negative or a bad thing, but it's something that you use as driving fuel to accomplish what you want to do. I think that's something that's like, there's something to be said about that, especially when I think about Michael Jordan and you see him with this exact same trait. Absolutely. Okay. I, I think uh, I 100% agree with you. And I, here, here's the thing, man. We have worked hard. We have, you know, or are constantly perfecting our craft. Mm -hmm. We've made great decisions. Like we're not, I'm not, we're not stealing. We're not cheating people to this. Right. We're not, we're not scamming people. You know, we're, you know, we, I, I've had like TV commercials, like, What's the point of doing all this work and all this if you can't enjoy the fruits of your labor? And right. honestly, I, I, the other thing that I thought about too, I was talking about how a, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, how I have a hard time promoting because I won't want people to think this and that, but I have no problem promoting my friends and I have no problem being happy for my friends when they achieve their success. So why not promote myself and be happy for myself? Like, why is it so much easier to say, man, congratulations, you deserve that role or that car or that house. But when I deserve it or, or, or we deserve it, why can't I be happy for myself and feel like I've got to be like, oh, you, we're going to just eat this bread and die. I don't want to do too much. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't know how to do, I don't know why I feel like I need to dim what I do, right. but I never dim what my friends do or, or other people. I'm, I'm easily happy for them. So I'm trying to like break that mind state of myself where I can promote you. I can promote Toby and Tony's merch much more easily than I can promote my stuff. I feel no way about promoting my friends. Right. I feel like, well, if I promote my stuff, people are gonna get tired of seeing it or be like enough already. No more, no more. I'm I gonna promote like myself as much as, huh? No, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I think you're going to say something that I want to keep going. Oh, I was just going to say, I feel like the big leap has definitely. Um, oh, 
kind of trans I'm looking forward to reading it for this very reason. I think the problem for me is the sustainment of it. I really feel like that's why I have to do things in the moment. That's why I'm going to like, I'm thinking of activities for, you know, the book club to do. So it's more than just, that was a good word. I think it's really easy to read something, know something. I always say this head knowledge, but it's something Mm -hmm. different to actually execute. And I want to get beyond knowing the appropriate things to say. I want to get beyond knowing the right answer. I want to get to a point where my actions line up to what I've been taught and what I know to be true. I agree. And it's also, it's a, it's a do the work thing. Cause as much it's as I'm do the work thing. Yeah. I'm saying this to myself because I'm trying to remind myself, not because I fully believe it. You know right. what I'm saying? Like I need That's to tell myself. Say it again, Kev. Say it again. I'm saying this stuff to remind myself, not because I fully believe it, right? I'm, I'm reminding myself, like, you can promote your stuff. You, this is your audience. You deserve what you work for. And also, when someone compliments you and says, hey, Kev, you're really good at that, don't diminish that by saying, oh, you know, I'm just doing nothing. Like, if somebody says you're a marketing genius, which people say often, thank you. Thank you. That still, as I say thank you to that, bugs crawl underneath my skin because it is still very uncomfortable for me to say thank you to that when people compliment <laughs> what do you say josh josh gassing me up from from over there uh, right especially from people you know close to me people i admire but so i'm telling myself just say thank you so that each time it becomes more easy to to do it's kind of like earlier in one of your campaigns was like you are worthy. You are more than enough, as is, without change. Like, that didn't click the first time you said that. Right. You still have days where you don't feel worthy. You don't feel more than enough. You feel like you need to change. And you got to keep, like, it's got to become a mantra. Like, no, you are worthy. You are more than enough, as is, without change. You are worthy. You are more That's than enough. Exception. It's kind of like cool runnings. Yeah. I'm a bad mother. Yeah. Like, you got to keep saying that until it's like, yeah, and I'm out here. You feel me? I'm up in here. What's up? I deserve to be here. I belong in this room. Like you're fighting imposter syndrome. You're fighting the way you grew up. You're fighting that poor vision of yourself. You're fighting body dysmorphia, whatever it is in your life. You got to keep saying that until you're like, you know what? Nah, we off that. I'm not thinking about myself small like that no more. I deserve to be here. I deserve this. I am valuable. I bring something to the table. I wouldn't be in this room if I didn't have value. And then, then you start being like, okay, actually, you know, you know, it's like a basketball player. Like you hit, you miss a couple of shots. You're like, no, nah, I'm gonna keep after it. I'm good. Then you hit a couple more. And now you're like, okay, I'm back. I belong here. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's what I'm trying to get to. Like, I'm, I'm trying to operate in my zone of genius, big yeah. leap in all ways in life, not just business wise, but as a hu- husband, as a father. And sometimes that means saying, Hey, that thing no longer serves me because I am focusing on this now. And it might not be like, I, I got offered a consulting gig um, from a friend, good money, all that stuff. And normally I would have taken it. And I, because of this book, I realized I am taking this job. I would be taking this job because I like you. I want to support you. But the truth of the matter is, I don't want to spend my energy consulting for more other, for other companies right now. I just, I want to spend my energy using my marketing creative energy on building my company. Right. And although you might pay me a good amount, uh, that amount that you're giving me, that time is actually better spent building my company. And the truth is, I really don't want to build anybody else's company right now. Yeah. That's something I, I was doing. Years, by the way, but I'm not taking offense to this. You, but I no, no. You, you have told me that since all depth. And I try to rationalize myself into you know, saying why it would work and all that. But I finally now, because what is the truth is all death was still safe. Right. To be an executive and talent, I got the best of both worlds, but I wasn't going to fully become myself. And so I said, I got to quit this job and go for it. I couldn't really do both. And that's the next step is like really realizing like, Kev, you really have the skills. But the fact when the person sent me an email, I was just like, Great. So wait, Kev, hold on. Let's, we got to wrap this conversation up, but really quick. We don't have to do nothing, Liz. We can talk more. Stop being Jojo.
I, Angel's not going to be here for another 30 minutes. Let's keep going. Okay. I wanted you to briefly, quickly explain the zone of genius for those who haven't read the book, because I don't, I didn't know, what, I didn't know what I was saying when I was saying it, but I think you got it with the terminology. Yes. I, I, I'm trying to remember exactly. Basically, there's the zone of competence it means you can do something, you can do something, uh, uh, but there other people can do it just as well, if not better. There's a zone of excellence where you do something and not many people in your trade or craft can do it well, right? And there's a zone of genius where you are operating fully in something you excel at. It comes easy to you and other people cannot do it nearly as well. Let's take Beyonce for an example. Okay. Beyonce was great. Mm -hmm. Beyonce was great in Destiny's Child. She was right. a fantastic singer. She was a fantastic lead singer, right? That's her zone of competence uh, or excellence. Beyonce as an actress in Austin Powers is competent. She can act, but there's a lot more people who do this much better than it's she does. Right? I love you, Biba. It's a lot, it's a lot more people. Yeah. Her like zone of genius. A little generous, but <laughs> keep going. <laughs> her zone of genius is her Coachella performance. Sure. When you're watching that, you're like, there is not many people on earth that can command this stage and do what she is doing right now. Hardly anybody can do this. So for Beyonce to be at her best, it's better for her to spend her time preparing to do the Coachella performance and eliminate the album than acting in Obsessed, where she stinks <laughs> as an actress. She stinks in Austin Powers, but she is genius level at being Beyonce at Coachella, where you're like, oh, she is in her MF She's better and back. than Michael Jackson. She is <laughs> very good. And she is probably the best at this. LeBron James playing game seven versus LeBron James in Trainwreck. Right. He's just an actor in Trainwreck. In games, you know what I'm saying? So. In order to operate in your zone of genius, you have to turn down things that are in your zone of competence or maybe sure. even excellence sure. because you need to operate fully in your genius level. And for me, my marketing ideas come the best when I'm promoting something that I'm in and that I want right. to be a part of. I can be competent or even excellent consulting for your company, but I'm, you're never going to get all of me because if I give you a really good idea, I'm going to be mad at myself sure. that I didn't keep it for myself. Sure. Right? Sure. So now I'm like, let me focus 100% on the things that I want to build. And even if I need to turn down some money um, and I have to turn down the provider thing of the husband and the safety and all that, because if I can really kill at this, I'm operating at a better level than me doing that for you. So that's kind of what I'm like, this is me at my very best. And I only want to, and that's also what I want for you, for Josh, for Angel, uh, Tony, Jay, my boys, but each person has to identify their zone of, of genius sure. and then move aside the distractions. I can't get you out of your head. I can tell you what book to read, but I can't identify you for you what is your zone of genius. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I can't tell you, like, let's go, Liz, let's go. You got to be the one. And that's why most people won't ever do it. It's not because they don't have a zone of genius. It's because they let fear prevent fear, priorities, whatever, prevent them from operating in their zone of genius, not because they don't have the ability and the capability of doing so. I think the other portion is, I think people look a lot at their zones of excellence. It's competence, excellence, and then genius, right? The hierarchy going up yes yes so i think a lot of people have a lot in the zone of excellence that it's hard to figure out which one is actually your zone of genius yeah, absolutely and so and this actually goes back to um very early on and i've used this example over and over and i've never quite put it in these terms but it's going to make sense with me with makeup it's a zone of excellence for me, I would yes. say. Yes. that I'm really good at. Like, I'm better than the average person. I don't, if I wanted to be a professional, I absolutely could because I know enough to, like, yes. do. Um, I can go to school, get the, like, official certification, boom, bang, bang, and I can do it. 
But I mm -hmm. always, I never felt that it was my zone of genius. Of course, I wouldn't have used those words back there. No, no, back the language is new for you. Right, the language is new, but I knew in my gut that it just wasn't it for me. And I think that's how a lot of people feel. It took me a long time to kind of figure out, okay, girl, well, if it ain't that, you, like, what else is available to you? I'm looking around and ain't other, it ain't a whole bunch of other options. And yeah. I, that's the part that people, people, me, I am people, you struggle with is you could have this huge bucket of excellence and trying to pick what's the one to pull out as your mm -hmm. zone of genius, I think that's difficult. And it's especially it difficult for people that don't have a talent that's monetizable. So Absolutely. you are funny. That's something that's obvious and tangible and something that you can say, this is what I want to monetize and capitalize on. Uh, I don't, for those people, again, me, I am people that don't have that, it's, it takes a little bit more work to try to figure that out. And that's where like that exposure to all of these different avenues in life come into play because it's not just, I'm funny. It's not just, I, you know, can do whatever is a, a tangible skill. You kind of have to do more work to figure that out. And, and that's hard. And sometimes it's frustrating to be honest. I 100% agree with you. No, no argument here, but also there was a time when the, the monetizable skill I have now wasn't monetizable like this. Sure. Right. I had to search it out. Like from Boeing, the being a stand-up comedian professionally wasn't an option in Tacoma. I could do it for fun. I could get paid a little bit, but I couldn't do it for a job. So I had to figure out what that was for me. And that's where, you know, YouTube and, you know, Little Rascals and all that other stuff came. Like, and even like, you know, people ask me, am I a movie writer? Like I can write a movie. Mm -hmm. I don't live and breathe writing the yeah, way but someone else. I don't else. even know if it's your zone of excellence as much as just the zone of competence for you. For movie writing? Yeah. I agree. Oh. It's just something I can do. I'm not even excellent and it's definitely not genius. So I need to get someone who's operating at their genius level writing for me. Right. Directing for me. Even from like a, the way a director thinks and sees stuff. Remember when we shot that thing with Issa Rae? The way he was like, I was like, bro, I would never think of that right. in years. So for me to make the best film, it doesn't mean I need to write, direct, produce. I don't need to do that. I need to say, you write, you direct. Right. I will act. I will market. I'll do what I do best, which is sure. be funny and market. You make sure to call. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how you get the best project. I remember I was watch, I did watch in the office and my favorite cold open is the fire uh, scene where Dwight does the you know thing and, and fakes a fire thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching that and being like, I can never write that myself. Sure. And I was talking to somebody about that. And he was like, bro, no one person wrote that. There's like 30 people in that writer's room. Like that's all the best. He was like, that show had the best writers Hollywood had right. at the time all working together. Right. So one person's idea is maybe Angela should throw the cat up Sure. And, oh, that's funny. And somebody else says, what if it came down in a different, you know what I'm saying? Like, but that's all these people operating their zone of genius together. together. So that's Absolutely. what I need to build around me. And you're part of that. For our company, I need you at your zone of genius and me at my zone of genius sure. and Tony and Josh and Brennan. And then the project is like, oh, snap. Sure. They really in their bag. But that's why I want all my friends to read the book because it's going to be, I'm going to get frustrated if I, that's what Jordan was so frustrated at. He was operating in his genius and everybody else was competent or excellent at best. And he didn't need them to be him, but he needed them to be the best versions of them. Right. And it's frustrating to be around people who can't at least be the best versions of them. Sure. If you're being the best version of you, because then you're like, there's so much more in you. And you're really hurting my chances of succeeding because you're afraid to be the best you. If you can hit a three, but you're afraid to take the shot, we lose because they're going to triple to me. And when I pass it to you, you got to shoot that, baby. I need you to be Paxson or Steve Kerr. I don't need you to go for 40 like me. I don't need you to hit a triple double. But if I'm the decoy, you got to doggone hit that shot. I only need three points out of you, that one shot. Sure. And that's what Jordan had with Paxson. Like, let me give you eight. But the last two was a two you couldn't hit. Right. Because they they know you want the last shot, right? And that's what I need from my team. Otherwise, 
I got to get somebody else in here who's going to take the shot. Even if you miss, you are at least going to be open. Sure. I'm not even going to be open. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I want out of everybody around me. And the more I get into it, the more I'm going to demand it from you or I'm gonna get someone else to do it. Because the more I get- like, the more like, let's all just be clear. Get somebody to do it. You know I ain't talking about you. Okay, I just you wanna know. make sure we're clear because you just kept talking and I just wanna make sure that we're talking about what we're talking about and not talking about what we're not talking about, okay? Let's just all make sure we're reading from the same book and we're all on page 12, paragraph three, line two. Are you done? I am now. All I need is when Josh, I asked Josh to edit the documentary and he was like, I can't do it. And I'm like, you can do it. And right. He's like, I can do it. And then he turns it in. Yes, that's right. all I need. Right. I need you to be in your bag. These brand deals that Josh is editing, I'm like, whoo, baby. Now we, now when you pay me that money, I can turn that in with confidence because I'm like, yo, this is something I couldn't do. Right. Right. But that might mean, okay, Josh, you don't edit podcasts anymore. Because right. somebody else can do that. Let's put you on these things because you sure. are really taking the level up, right? right? That's all I'm saying. I'm not going to replace my wife with a white woman. Okay. Anything else? I don't know if that got, oh, it just got to them. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. And I, and I think that that's why I'm kind of the most excited because like even with us working with Brennan and Transit Pictures and the way the comedy show looks now, I'm like, okay, y'all are doing your version of what I do. Sure, best. absolutely. And you know, for me, you've been in those meetings where I'm like, I can't do this. Right. I would have had Josh shooting that on an iPhone in here. Right. And we would not have the success we had at that because that's, it looks better with iPhones. Absolutely. I mean, it looks better, it looks better with better real, with, right. with cameras, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's kind of one thing I learned in therapy that like, uh, part of our next level of success requires me to let go a little bit mm -hmm. and trust that the other person that I'm giving this to can hold their own. Because if I try to hold on to everything, it doesn't I, it's not a scalable solution. Yeah, I think that's the other part that's really um, quite interesting is we both are holding on to models that are not sustainable long-term. I've been listening to, um, what's his name? Sam Johnson or something like that. I can't remember. Anyway, he's this YouTuber. That, Sam, no, not Sam Smith. He's a YouTuber that um, analyzes singing videos. I think it's Sam. Oh, your white boy that yeah. you've been listening to for the last week. Yeah, I don't know. I randomly got hooked on him and I just absolutely adore him. But one of the things that he always talks about are singers who can, you can hit this note or you can do something. Yeah, you can do it. It may even sound really great right now, but is that sustainable long-term? Is the shortcut that you're doing now that can get the results that you want, but in the long-term it's actually doing damage, is that sustainable? Are you actually crippling your career today by taking the shortcut today that you don't even know in the future it's going to end up not being working in your benefit and I think that's what this conversation is about it's about recognizing that you have to let go of control because that's a sustainable model for scaling it's about recognizing that I can't hold on to every dollar because that's not sustainable there are things that you're just not in your area of genius not even in your area of excellence so you can't do it all so you have to outsource you have to hire help be okay with letting go of those dollars. That's that's a sustainable model. And so I think even as a kite, you know, we want to, well, at least me, I want to get on my pedestal and talk about how I'm the stable one and look at me saving my money and I'm so responsible. And at the end of the day, that's not sustainable either. So we both have things. Really? That are, look at that, Liz. First of all, I already have said that. You ain't said that clearly. Well, read between the lines. Um, so anyway, do you have anything else you want to add? I think we're at a good point to, I don't want to run in circles, but I think we've exhausted no, no. this conversation. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I've, I've reached my um, end with this. I just <laughs> want to say I'm, this year has sucked in so many ways, but yes. was also necessary in so many ways. I think I would have been running the same way had I not had this forced adjustment period right 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 
and I'm just trying to take advantage of this as opposed to like not um, not uh, or uh, for a good part of quarantine, I was just like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. Me too. <laughs> right? And I and I think you deserve that time, right? But then you're gonna be like, okay, now what am I gonna do about it? Right. I'm saying like, and if you stay in the this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, okay, then you, now what? Right. Like you gotta feel your, my therapist always says, feel your feelings, give those feelings a voice, and then you need to adjust and move. What does yeah. that, how does it make you feel? I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm frustrated. Okay, now what? Like, and take your time feeling those feelings. Like, it, it takes time, right? But feeling your feelings and dwelling on your feelings sure. are, are, are separate things, right? You got to give the adequate time to each of those, you know? So uh, we looked around and we're like, okay, this world is, this part of the world's not changing for months. So what, <clears throat> what are you going to do with the way the world is now? Not where you want it, not where it used sure. to be, sure. where it is right now. What are you going to do? right now and a lot of businesses we you know we've studied this and a lot of businesses that grow successfully capitalize on a certain moment in time that may not ever come back around again like the i'm gonna keep talking about it but it's also a good example bob johnson built bet at a certain time when there wasn't black representation on tv right. he had a lot of access to black content that people have made he had people that wanted to see it and he had advertisers that wanted to get you know uh the black uh or get the black audience's eyes on these products right right he admitted like he couldn't make bt right now right so right now you can't go safely everywhere to a stand-up comedy show right some places are safe some places are unsafe some places have limited capacity blah 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 i don't know how long we'll do keep your distance comedy but for right now this is the only way i can do stand-up comedy sure. and it's a more sustainable business model than trying to force myself to risk coronavirus Absolutely. by performing five nights in a in a show maybe it lasts for three months maybe it lasts for three years but this is what i got to do right now so let me make the most of it you know what i'm saying um so that's kind of all i'm really excited about um uh the the life that we are building even though it comes with its bumps and bruises yeah yeah you know it definitely so. does and this year has definitely been a lot of bumps and a lot of bruises, but I think yeah, and it, it, it makes you better. Bumps. It definitely makes you better. Yeah. And, and honestly, in, in our marriage, there's a lot of times where it's like, <laughs> these situations bring out the extremes of our personalities. Right. You know what I mean? And sometimes that clashes with like your money story, you know, with my money story, the way you see yourself, the way I, you know what I'm saying? And it's, you know, and then like adjusting and all that stuff. So, it is still exciting to move forward together. Yeah. And that's what I'm most excited about. Yes. All right. Any last words? Any last thoughts? I got a doo-doo. Of course you do. Thank I you, had guys. I an empty stomach. And I, this one Why come out. Well, I, I was sleepy. Oh, okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for today's Love Hour podcast. Um, I'll think of a topic for next week. But I enjoyed this conversation. So thank you, Kevin, for like going in with me. Um, it was great. Yeah. Um, okay. That's it. That's all. Until the next episode. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah.